<laughs> Good morning. I'm Pastor Jay Beckley from uh, Stone Creek Bible Church in Temecula, California. And I am just delighted that you've taken some time out of your week this week to spend in the Word of God with us. And uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 24 this morning, the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to do the whole chapter. So it's going to be a wild morning. Hold on to your hats. And uh, I hope you brought your Bible on a phone or a pad or something. Uh, because you're going to want to read the scriptures that talk about uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the way that historical event changes everything about the lives that we experience. <clears throat> and so I am excited about that. And uh, <clears throat> let me see. I got to find chapter 24. Where does that begin? All right, here we go. Chapter 24. Uh, just before we read, I just want to remind you that Luke chapter 1, Luke says basically his purpose. He, his purpose was to outline the story of the events of Jesus' life for a man that was probably his patron. Luke was a physician, and so he was probably um, supported by this man, Theophilus, that he writes the Gospel of Luke to. He actually addresses the Gospel of Luke to Theophilus at the beginning in the first chapter. And he says that my purpose is to communicate to you the content of the eyewitness testimony about the events uh, of Jesus' life. And so Luke does this in a very effective way throughout the gospel. But here in Luke 24, this most important chapter in the whole gospel, we see things that may, may cause questions. It may make you think, well, why didn't he tell this story or why didn't he tell that story? And if you're familiar with the other Gospels, you know there's a lot of details and Luke doesn't communicate very many of them. I'm actually surprised that when Luke talked about the crucifixion, he didn't really talk about very many of the medical issues revolving the crucifixion. He talked about the people who saw Jesus die and how it impacted their life. We talked about that last week. The centurion, the thief on the cross, the people who watched the crucifixion experience, the apostles, some of the, and, and his focus was on the people. And today we're going to see that he does the same thing with the resurrection. He doesn't really focus on the resurrection per se, he refocuses on how it affected the people that uh, were there, the people that experienced it. So, Luke 24, the first section, verse 1. On the first day of the week, and that's why we worship on Sunday, not on the Sabbath day or Saturday, is because Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week. And that's when the disciples went to the temple to glorify God. And every Sunday, as they, memor as they remembered that resurrection and how, what difference it made in their life, that's when they began to worship together. Very early in the morning, so sometime between 3 and 6 o'clock, the, the early shift, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb which I find uh, is amazing because they weren't expecting the resurrection. This little detail tells us that the women who were following Jesus were not prepared for a resurrection. They were taking spices. They had probably spent a lot of money to buy these valuable spices to, to go and, and, and bomb Jesus' body or prepare his body for, for his burial. And they were not expecting a resurrection. And I think that's a key thing. To understand they found the stone rolled away from the tomb but when they entered they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus now remember they had stood back and watched Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea wrap the cloth around Jesus and cover his head and anoint his his burial clothes with some preliminary spices and just in a hurried way trying to get his body ready so that they could go home and begin to observe the Sabbath at sunset. And so the women were coming to finish the job. And they arrive early in the morning and the stone is rolled away and they go in and there's no body. And they had stood outside and watched the preparations. And I am just amazed that they would have been shocked and surprised and confused and had all kinds of emotional things that would have been going on in their minds and in their hearts. <clears throat> While they were wondering about this, verse 4, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. And I think that's a euphemism. That's a, that's a way of kind of telling the story without using the word angel. But it seems like these two guys who are wearing this gleaming clothes 
uh, were in the tomb and they and their fright and they <laughs> and in their fright the women bowed down with their faces to the ground but the men said to them why do you look for the living among the dead he is not here he has risen remember how he told you while he was still with you in galilee the son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners be crucified and on the third day be raised again and then they remembered his words and so these men at the tomb didn't rebuke the women for not being prepared for a resurrection. They, they weren't shocked at the woman's surprise. They just simply reminded the women that Jesus had told them that these things were going to happen. And then they remembered, oh my goodness, that's absolutely right. And as we've read through the, book, the Gospel of Luke, three different times in, throughout the Gospel of Luke, we are told that Jesus took his disciples aside and that he told them what was going to happen to him when they went to Jerusalem. Verse 9, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, the young girl who had been delivered, delivered from seven demons. Joanna, and Joanna, we learn in other parts, was the wife of Herod's uh, steward, like the guy who ran Herod's palace. And so this was a wealthy woman who was politically connected. Her husband was an important Roman official. And then Mary, the mother of James. And uh, this is a, an interesting um, prelude to the next section that we'll read. But Mary, the mother of James, was the mother of James the Less and Jude, who were disciples of Jesus. And scholars believe that this Mary... Um, was the wife of a man named Cleopas. And we'll read about Cleopas in the next section. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, but it's just an interesting anchor for this uh, story that we'll come to, is this Mary. And then others with them who told this to the apostles. But the apostles did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. And so this first section is all about the initial discovery that the body of Jesus was missing. Now, the first to discover it were the women. And in some of the Gospels, where the women are not even mentioned, because women in that day were considered to be, like, illogical, <laughs> emotional, and nonsensical. And so they, they didn't even have the ability to testify in court because really nobody believed that the women could keep anything straight. And so when this passage says, oh my goodness, the apostles didn't believe the women, it just makes me imagine a, a circumstance or an event in my life where the women in my family would be excited about telling a story and there would be so many things going on that... The problem wasn't that the women didn't make sense. The problem was that as a man, I couldn't follow 13 conversations all going on at the same time. And I, I see that sometimes when my wife and her mom and sister and a bunch of gals get together. They can all talk at the same time for like five minutes. And I'm standing there thinking, oh my gosh, you know, nobody's listening, you know. <laughs> but then when they're done, they all understand all the stories that everybody has said, and they feel fully clued in on what's going on. And I'm scratching my head going, what in the world? What did anybody say? I didn't follow that. So I kind of feel like uh, this is an interesting scriptural note, perhaps on the culture of the day. It's an interesting um, little observation about the way the, d the different ways that women and men communicate and live and experience life. And uh, <clears throat> I have a tendency to think that the problem here isn't in the way the women communicated. The problem was probably in the fact that the disciples weren't, weren't on track. They weren't expecting the right things. And one of the things I'd like to share with you uh, in this first section uh, <clears throat> is that I just love the, the detail and the confusion and uh, the stuff, the noise in this experience. And the people clearly did not understand what was going on. They weren't prepared. They didn't expect it. They had, they had no clue what to do with the experience that they had. But the angels, the angels had told them, hey, <laughs> don't you remember? Jesus told you what was going to happen. 
Now, my first point this morning is that is kind of a, a theme that will run through this chapter. That if we are going to make sense of the circumstances of our life, if we're going to be able to make sense of the values of Christianity, if we're going to be able to make sense of the Christmas season, we are going to have to be willing to adjust our expectations to the Word of God. Because the Word of God fills in the details for us. And the confusion and the fear and the different things that come up in our hearts and in our minds often come up because we're not paying attention. <laughs> We're not studying the Word. We're not reading the Word. We're not listening to what Jesus said. We're not prepared uh, to experience life the way He wants us to experience it because we're just not tuned in. <laughs> kind of like those guys listening to the women, couldn't figure out what they were saying. And so Peter has to go to the tomb and check it out for himself. And I love that because that is often a great way to understand this passage. People may come to you with ideas and opinions and all kinds of things. And the, the truth is that unless you go to the tomb and experience it yourself, you're not really going to understand what God wants to do in your life. One of the things I love about Christianity is it's not a list of rules. It's designed as a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that each one of us are invited to be a part of. Come and listen to what Jesus says. Come and see what Jesus did. Come and experience how Jesus felt about the people in his life and the way he treated them. And getting to know Jesus is how you become a Christian, because being a Christian is all about being like Jesus. And so when we see him, when we hear him, then that helps to inform our own opinions and experiences and decisions. So adjusting our expectations to the Word of God is a part of the theme we're going to see run through this whole chapter. The next section, verse 13, on the road to Emmaus. Now this is a long passage. And it's a story about two guys who are on their way to a town about seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they walk, they're talking about the experiences and the, the things that they've heard and the, the news about what happened when Jesus was crucified. And the way the disciples dealt with it and the way the Romans dealt with it and the way the chief priests dealt with it. And so they're, they're going to Emmaus. And the word there actually is uh, a translation of hot springs. And so... Whoever these guys were, they were going to a village about seven miles outside of Jerusalem called Hot Springs. So they were maybe a little bit overwhelmed by the whole circumstance that they had experienced in Jerusalem celebrating the Passover. And so they needed to rest, go rest at the Hot Springs. And so they're walking back there. And then on the way on this seven mile walk, they meet a guy on the road, verse 17, and he asked them, what are you guys discussing together as you walk along? <laughs> they stood in their faces downcast, and one of them named Clopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? <laughs> and then the, the guy says, well, well, what things? In other words, you tell me what's happened. <clears throat> and they replied, Jesus was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. And so then they give the details of what they've experienced during that weekend of Passover celebrations in Jerusalem. And then in verse 25, the man walking along with them says, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? <laughs> and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which we are going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. And so he went in to stay with them. I love that, that, that Jesus wasn't pressuring them. He wasn't preaching to them. He wasn't you know, holding on to a captive audience. It looked like he was just going to walk on on his journey and let them go home. And they, they just were like, no, you know, you're, you're filling the spaces. You're helping us figure this stuff out. You got to come with us. Come and have dinner with us because the day's almost over. But you notice what, what he had told them. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. <laughs> and as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on. They urged him strongly, stay with us. Verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them. 
And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked with us on the road, opening the scriptures to us? And they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. <laughs> I think it took them most of the day to walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And because they, they would have left in the morning, they would have gotten there just before sunset. And uh, then what happens? They recognize, oh my goodness, this is Jesus. When he broke the bread and shared it with them and then prayed, it was like they were just right back at the Last Supper. And it was like the Lord took the blinders off their eyes and they realized that it was Jesus. Now, when you think through that, sometimes it's hard to understand. Why didn't these guys recognize Jesus? Well, because they had seen him scourged by a Roman officer who whipped his back until it was turned into, into just a bloody mess. They had beat him and pulled out his beard and put a crown of thorns on his head. He had scars on his face. And, 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 and the last time they had seen him, he was not even recognizable as a person. And I think that uh, this situation, this chapter actually helps us to understand that when Jesus showed himself to his disciples, he was, he was back in, in good shape. Like his beard was probably longer than it had been. Uh, his... Uh, wounds had scarred over already in just a day and a half. So he had been healed physically and they didn't recognize him. And I just think that this is a, this is great. And so they jump up and they run back to Jerusalem and they get to Jerusalem and the disciples are just finishing up dinner. And so they come in, they get up and return at once to Jerusalem. Verse 33, they found the 11 and those with them and assembled together. And they were saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened to them on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Now, this road to Emmaus story is only in the Gospel of Luke. And the significance of it, I believe, is that God wants to communicate, and Luke is communicating, that the experience of the resurrection wasn't just something that Mary Magdalene and Peter were in charge of. The experience of the resurrection was something that all the women in the group who went to support each other and to complete the burial of Jesus, they experienced that. And these two disciples that were just walking home from Jerusalem, maybe because they were frustrated and overwhelmed by the experiences of the holiday, they get to meet Jesus on the road. Jesus reached out to people that weren't important. Jesus reached out to people that were just average people. <laughs> and I think that's a reminder that that's exactly what Jesus does for us. He reaches into our lives. He helps us solve our confusion and our fears and our questions and helps us to understand who he is and what we can become when we put our faith and trust in him. And so I love this story of the road to Emmaus and the fact that it's unique to the Gospel of Luke is a, a special treat. And as I read through it, I ask the questions, you know, why didn't they recognize Jesus? Why didn't they remember what Jesus said? Why were they so confused? Why were they going home, not staying with the other Christians there in Jerusalem, where most of the disciples of Jesus were? Well, I don't know. But I know that what was important is that Jesus came to them as they were headed in the wrong direction. He got their attention and he reminded them that they needed to focus their mind and their heart, not on their experiences, not on their fear and their confusion, but on what the Word of God had said to them in the Bible. You notice that uh, Jesus tells them all the things that were written about him in Moses and the prophets. Verse 25. So I'd like to uh, take just a second and ask you, how many things can you remember that are prophesied in the Old Testament about Jesus. What does the Old Testament tell us about Jesus that the New Testament shows the fulfillment of? Anything you can think of that the Old Testament tells us about Jesus? <laughs> so this is kind of a test for you. You know, how well are you basing your faith on the scriptures, on the word of God? And what can we remember as we go through? <laughs> Line of David, riding on a donkey. Absolutely. What else? Come on, I know you know. Born in Bethlehem. Born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin. Okay, that's, was that four things or five things? Four. 
Let's let's keep going a few more. Come on, there's got to be a few more things that we know. Crush the head of the snake, bruise the heel, bruise his heel. That's right. Which was a which which some people believe was a reference to crucifixion because that's the way geologists identify people that were crucified because their heels are crushed um, with that action that happens on the cross. What else? Isaiah nine six. Absolutely. A child is born. For unto us a child is born, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. All those things. Absolutely. What else? Well, let me just tell you. Scholars who have studied the Old Testament prophecies have come up with about 300 different clues that help to identify Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. Oh, my goodness. There are 47 really clear references to Jesus, like the spear that would go in his side, the hands and feet being pierced, which was an, ex which was an identification of crucifixion as his death, the fact that he was um, tortured, the fact that he was mocked in public, the fact that his beard was pulled. There's, there's so many little details, 47 of these things. And then there's about eight prophecies, which are kind of the ones that we've uh, capsulated, that are very clear indications of God's purpose in Jesus' life. Now, a few years ago, a couple of guys wanted to identify how difficult this, this issue of prophecy is. So they wrote a book called Science Speaks, and it was all about taking the different prophecies of the Old Testament and asking, like, how difficult is this to predict something about Jesus before he's born? And so they didn't take 300 prophecies. They didn't take 47 prophecies. They only took eight prophecies, and most of them were the ones we've mentioned this morning. Eight prophecies. Well, the probability of getting eight prophecies correct about someone before they were even born, you know, the details of how they would be born, where they would be born, where they would live, that they would go to Egypt, that they would be um, ridiculed, that they would be crucified, that they would be buried with, uh, that they would be crucified with criminals, that they would be buried with rich people in a rich, in a rich man's tomb, tomb. If you just take eight prophecies, not 47, not 300, if you just take eight, the probability is that you will be right one out of every 10 to the 17th power. <laughs> That's one time out of every 10 with 17 zeros. And so to understand what that huge number is, they use an illustration in their book. They say if you took silver dollars and you covered the state of Texas with silver dollars two feet deep, and then you took one silver dollar and you painted it red and you threw it out in the middle of the state of Texas and stirred it up. And then you told somebody, <laughs> okay, you get one chance to go out and pick up a silver dollar and you've got to get the right one. <laughs> well, their chances of being able to find the right silver dollar are one in 10 to the 17th power. Can you imagine? Oh my goodness. So this idea of prophecy in the Bible is a, is a huge thing. And it's a thing that skeptics often just casually ignore as if it was insignificant. But when you look at the gospel story, when you read the details of how Jesus was treated, and you discover that it's nearly impossible to make this up <laughs> and make it up ahead of time and communicate details to people. Oh my goodness, that just does not work. And so I love the fact that in this gospel, Luke is challenging us to adjust our expectations to fit the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Figure out how the Word of God affects your faith, affects the circumstances of your life, affects the things that you believe and the things that you hold dear. Now, the third thing that I want to... The third section of this is Jesus appearing to the disciples in, in verse 36. He says, While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. <laughs> a typical Middle Eastern greeting. Peace be with you. In other words, I'm not here to hassle you. I'm not here to frustrate you. I'm here to bring peace. I'm here to bring resolution. I'm here to bring confidence. And they were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? So this actually characterizes the attitudes of the disciples. 
They weren't in charge. They, weren't, they hadn't figured this thing out. They were refused. They were confused. They were frightened. They had no idea what to do with what their experiences had, had taken them through. Verse 39, look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And so he's addressing Luke. As Luke tells this story, he's not only helping, the, helping us to understand how Jesus met the disciples, how the disciples responded, and what it means to see Jesus in the flesh in this little room full of disciples. It's, it's amazing. The fact that Jesus reveals himself after his crucifixion in a physical body that they could touch is amazing. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet, and while they still did not believe because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? <laughs> and they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And uh, the King James says a piece of broiled fish and a piece of honeycomb. <laughs> so if you're, if you're reading the King John, James, Jesus got an extra special treat. They gave him a honeycomb. And the NIV and the ESV that I usually use uh, take that out. Verse 43, and he took it and ate it in their presence. So he ate food in front of them. And uh, I'm thinking that, uh, you know, my, my brain automatically conjures up this picture of Casper the ghost eating fish. And, you know, he puts it in his mouth and you can kind of see it go through him and hang out in his stomach for a while. And, you know, Jesus was saying, no, I'm not a spirit. I am a person. I am the man that you loved and cared for, the man who listened to you, the man who walked with you, the man who ate with you. In verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And those are three sections of scripture. But as I go through this, I can't imagine what it would have been like for Jesus to have revealed these things on the road to Emmaus, walking along with those two guys, you know, talking about God's promise to Eve that her seed would, would save mankind. God's promise to Abraham that, that his seed would be a blessing to the whole world. God's promise to Isaac, Abraham's son, that his seed, again, would be a blessing to the whole world. Then to Jacob and to Judah and to David, the promises that the Messiah of God would come through their line, that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be executed by the Romans, that he would be crucified, which was a totally strange thing in, in, in 600 B.C., when uh, Daniel and Isaiah wrote about crucifixion. <clears throat> and as we get into Zechariah, that Jesus would enter Jerusalem on a donkey. I mean, all the details that are part of these passages. Psalm 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 31. Um, passages that David wrote that help us to understand how Jesus was going to feel and what he was going to go through during his life here on earth are amazing. God literally unfolds this plan so that we can see it. Then Jesus comes and does it and nobody's paying attention. And now we've seen the resurrection of Christ and still don't always understand what it means and how important it is. I love. And so these verses kind of open some questions in my heart that make me want to go back and study the Old Testament from Genesis all the way to Malachi. Oh my goodness looking for clues about God's purpose and God's plan. <clears throat> and then in verse 45, he opens their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And so that's a part of that great commission that Matthew talks about. And Luke, several years later, after Matthew's gospel was published, um, Luke characterize it, characterizes it this way, that Jesus just put that out there, that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Oh my goodness, not just a Jewish thing, but the resurrection has global implications. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Oh my goodness. So there's three things in this passage that we want to take away. One is the confidence that we get when we adjust our expectations to the Word of God. The clarity and the confusion when we pay attention to what Jesus has said. And then the third thing is power from on high. 
which again was kind of prophetic, and Jesus was wanting to prepare the disciples for what happened on the day at Pentecost, uh, where the disciples um, preached in languages and people heard in their own mother tongues the gospel. And 3,000 people were baptized that day at the temple as, as Christians. And not as uh, just Jews, but as people who believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 50, when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. And so at the end of the Gospel of Luke, you have this picture of men and women whose confusion was almost instantly changed into confidence and courage. You have the story of men and women who, who were devastated. And within a few days, Jesus is up on the Mountain of Olives, on the backside of the Mount of Olives in Bethany. <laughs> and uh, he is helping them understand where joy comes from. And this is the third Sunday of Advent this year, and the theme of the third Sunday of Advent is joy. And I'm just amazed that uh, Luke ends with this value. Like, oh my goodness, there is joy in Christmas when we celebrate the coming of Jesus, but there is joy at the end of Jesus' life as we celebrate his resurrection and the beginning of something totally new that will affect every one of our lives. Joy. Where does joy come from? Well, joy comes from being blessed by Jesus. Joy comes from worshiping who God is. Joy comes from uh, being in fellowship. They continually stayed at the temple. They were in fellowship together. They shared their problems and their confusion. They didn't judge. They didn't uh, criticize each other. They, they held each other uh, in their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they spent their time praising God. Now, I love this chapter because it, it, it takes the message of Luke and it wraps it up with a nice bow on it. Oh my goodness. The Bible is designed to help us to see through one of the biggest divisions that we experience as humans. The book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon talks about under the sun. Under the sun, it seems like life is empty. It seems like life is worthless. It seems like there are no values. And what Solomon was doing was describing a kind of a materialistic view a view that says, no, I only believe in things I can touch and feel. I only believe in things that I can see. I only believe in things under the sun. And the point of the book of Ecclesiastes is that if we only look at life under the sun, we're going to miss out on really important things. If we look at life as a materialist who only believes in material things, then we miss out on so much. We miss out on love. That's not material. We miss out on loyalty. That's not material. We miss out on, on most of the human values. Those are not material things, but they're part of a spiritual world that exists and some people choose to ignore. Well, this story peels back the veil on a spiritual world. The women went to the tomb and it was empty, but they saw angels. <laughs> oh my goodness. Now, as an apologist, that's not the kind of thing that you write in a document that you're trying to prove something happened. <laughs> and I'm amazed that Luke tells the story just the way it is, just the way the witnesses experienced it. They saw angels at the beginning of the story. What does that tell us? It tells us that this story asserts the reality of spiritual things that we cannot see and touch. Angels. The Bible talks about demons. The Bible talks about a Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about spiritual beings. And I love the fact that Luke opens this up in the beginning of the chapter. And then when Jesus comes to meet with the disciples, he is communicating a reality that's both spiritual and physical. He is communicating that he was not just a spirit. He was a resurrected human being with a physical something. <laughs> And I don't know how to describe it. It was a physical something that could appear in a locked room. It could be talking with two guys and then just disappear. Now, obviously, the, the resurrected body of Jesus had some abilities that we don't have. <laughs> I, I wonder what that means. But the point is that Jesus was communicating 
something about human beings and our resurrected experience, the experience that the Bible promises, that each one of us will experience this same kind of resurrection, this same kind of body that Jesus demonstrated during this period of time. Paul writes about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he helps prepare us for a reality that is much different than the people in the world around us would believe in. Luke chapter 24. It changes everything. It changes the way we look at our life and our circumstances because Jesus ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Lord Jesus, at, the, at God, the right hand of God the Father, is what Paul says. And so Jesus is ruling over the circumstances of our lives. And as I look around this room, I see people whose, circ whose life circumstances have, have caused incredible pain and suffering. Questions, confusion, depression. And yet this passage helps me to understand that when Jesus ascended into heaven, he is supervising, the Bible says he's, he's sitting in the throne in the presence of God the Father, supervising the circumstances of our lives, just like the circumstances that these disciples had experienced, seeing Jesus crucified, seeing their hopes crushed on that cross. And yet God reveals to us that he has a purpose and a plan for each one of our lives. That the circumstances in our life that cause pain and confusion are the very things that God wants to help us go through with his power. And I see that in this passage. Jesus says, hey, hold on until you receive the power of God. And we know he was talking about the disciples in the day of Pentecost, but the scripture promises that everybody who invites Jesus Christ to come into their life as their Lord and Savior receives the seal of the Holy Spirit in their lives has power to deal with challenges and frustrations and confusion and fear, all the things that we struggle with. And so this morning, I would just like to ask you to adjust your expectations to the Word of God. If you haven't figured out what it means to be a Christian, if you haven't really figured out what it means that God would love you so much that He would send His Son to die on the cross to save you from your sins, if you haven't figured out what Luke says... <laughs> The gospel message is designed to provide repentance and forgiveness for everyone who hears it all over the world. Oh my goodness. I hope you will take an opportunity this Christmas to invite the Lord to help you understand what Christmas means in your life. The fact that Jesus came to be part of your life, that he was born in a manger, that he lived just like you lived, that he experienced life just like you experienced, that he suffered through all of the things that we, that we suffer through and that he was victorious over it. I just love that. I love the promise that comes with it. And ask you to seriously consider this Christmas, reading through some of these passages that help us to understand who Jesus is and what he was like.